All right, I want to thank everybody for watching this lecture. This guy I knew about to do a little information on the um, Dogon for Black History Month. I'm going to get into this. Alright, the Dogons are an ethnic group located mainly in Mali, West Africa. There's a picture of some of their traditional masks and clothes. The Dogon. The Dogon are an African tribe located mainly in Bandiagra in Duoenza districts of Mali, West Africa. The tribe's population about 300,000 being mostly heavily concentrated along a 200 kilometer stretch called the Cliffs of Bandiagra in which they have managed to use to fashion some spectacular dwellings for themselves. Astronomy. The Dogon are famous for their astro astronomical knowledge taught through oral tradition dating back thousands of years, referencing the star system Sirius linked with the Egyptian goddess Isis. Now remember this right here. Sirius is linked with the Egyptian goddess Isis. The astronomical information known by the Dogon was not discovered and verified until the 19th and 20th centuries, making one wonder how the Dogon came by this knowledge. Their oral tradition say was given to them by the Nomo. The source of their information may date back to the time of the ancient Egyptian priests. The days of Kemet. But I think it's a little bit older than that. According to the Dogon, the universe is considered Amma's egg. Amma, who rests upon nothing, is the sky god and the creator of the universe. Within this egg, Amma began spinning around, forming the pole speed, the black hole at the galactic core. The pole is the smallest, heaviest, and densest thing that was made invisible at the center. Amma then placed seven words in the pole, which began to vibrate strongly within the seed. The spiraling vibrations cause four clavicles to grow forth from the pole. Suddenly the pole bur burst forth and the eight new seeds were created. Now remember that eight new seeds. Alma planted these seeds in his egg near the clavicles of the pole. With these eight seeds, Alma intended to create eight celestial beings. Four male and four female, just like the Egyptians. The Dogon called the beings the Nomo. Best translated the word no more that became the fish man. It also, oh. These eight um, beings were going to be Amma's perfect creation as sister and brother, yet husband and wife, just like the Egyptians. They, the four fish twins, were going to make each other fertile, complete, and blessed with heavenly happiness and fulfillment. However, one of the male twins, Ogo, grew impatient as he waited for his female twin to just date. Ogo decided to rebel from Alma. He jumped out of his celestial room and stole parts of the placenta. He then began creating and procreating with his own placenta in an attempt to recreate his own little world. His stolen placenta became impure and his actions greatly threw off the divine order Amma in, had intended. The Dogon say that our son, whom they call Ne, is the stolen placenta and the planet Earth is the rebel world established by Ogo. To reestablish order and purify creations of Ogo's Transgression, Amma decided to sacrifice one of the completed Nomo twins, Nomo Semi. Nomo Semi was composed of both male and female Nomo and was a complete and perfect being unto himself. Amma lifted Nomo Semi out of the celestial waters and tied the androgynous fish to the Kalina, mother of charcoal tree. And one 
swift cut animal slice the umbilical cord and genitals <laughs> of Nomo Semi. The sacrifice Nomo's blood and life force emptied from its navel and groan. Semi died a suffering and painful death. The Dogon say that Sirius A, the visible star of Sirius, whom the Dogon calls Sigi Tolo, is the celestial embodiment of the sacrifice. Amma then took the diama of the sacrifice Nomo and drifted on the former placenta of the celestial fish, the Sirius system. And the stolen placenta of its brother Ogo, or our son Nay, Amma's goal was to purify his creation from the transgressions of Ogo. It required him taking a pure and perfect being and sacrificing it. Amma intended for the spirit of Nomo Semi to heal Ogo's torn placenta and become one with the impure earth Ogo created. When Okay, I was just a brief summary about their uh, creation history. The Dogon priest said that Sirius had a companion star that was invisible to the human eye. They also stated that the star moved in a 50 year elliptical orbit around Sirius that was small and incredibly heavy and that it rotated on its axis. Now that 50 year elliptical orbit is a misnomer, it's supposed to be 60. Initially the Anthropologists wrote it off publishing the information in an obscure anthropological journal because they didn't appreciate the astronomical importance of the information. What they didn't know was that since 1844 astronomers had suspected that Sirius A had a companion star. This was in part determined when it was observed that the path of the star wobbled. In 1862 Alvin Clark discovered the second star making Sirius a binary system with two stars. In the 1920s it was determined that Sirius B, the companion of Sirius, was a white dwarf star. White dwarfs are small, dense stars that burn dimly. The pull of its gravity causes Sirius wavy movement. Sirius B is smaller than the planet Earth. The Dogon name for Sirius B is Potolo. It means star and smaller seed. C refers to creation in this case, perhaps human creation. By this name they describe the star's smallest. It is, they say, the smallest thing there is. They also claim that it is the heaviest star and it's, it is white in color. The Dogon thus attributed to Sirius B its three principal properties as a white dwarf, small, heavy, and white. So it was already on game. Now, I ain't finna read all this. I'm finna just go through briefly. The, the absence of the um, written language of the Dogon suggests that any close context that may have been occurred between Dogon and the ancient Egyptians may have happened prior to the onset of the written language in Egypt or roughly at the boundary between the pre dynastic and in dynastic Egypt. Support for this view can be found in many other aspects of Dogon cosmology and culture which can also be seen to make sense if we postulate an early Dogon relationship to ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, whatever you want to call it. Where Dogon cosmology defies eight relative undifferent ancestors slash teachers who emerge as paired opposites. Ancient Egypt defines eight paired ancestors, gods and goddesses, who together define a category of deity that is simply not found in Dogon cosmology. Again and again we see non-deities in Dogon cosmology, characters from Dogon mythology such as a jackal who symbolizes the concept of disorder and a fox who is defined as a judge between truth and, and error. Rise to the status of deities in ancient Egypt, yet Dogon cosmology also includes many cosmology elements from pre-dynastic Egypt that are known to have carried forward to ancient Egypt much in their pre-dynastic form. Such evidence again points to a likely time frame for any close contact between the Dogon and the ancient Egyptians at or around the boundary between pre-dynastic and dynastic Egypt. Matching aspects of the Dogon and Buddhist cosmology provide us with a series of defined shapes that are 
evoked by the cosmology and explicity assigned to symbolic concepts. The first of these is the circular sun glyph shape, which both the Dogon and the Buddhists associate with the sun. Among others is the shape of a hemisphere or dome, which is associated with the concept of essence or mass, substance or matter. Another is the shape of a square, which the Dogon and Buddhists relate to the uh, concept of space. These shapes and their associated concepts, the pairing of which is cross-confirmed between the plans of the Buddhist stupa and the Dogon granary, play out in similar ways to the sun glyph when we examine their usage in Egyptian words. So here is Sirius Invisible Light. I know it's a blurry picture. And here is Sirius through X-ray. We'll take a look at um, the Egyptian hieroglyphs. It, it looks like the um, their stars look like the X-ray photos. History in uh, mythology of Sirius. Sirius is also known as the Dog Star because it is, it is in the chief star in the constellation Canis Major, the Big Dog. Sirius is behind the sun as seen from Earth in the northern hemisphere summer so a lot of people thinking they see in Nibiru when they take these photos of the sun but it's really serious in late summer it appears in the east before sunrise near the sun in our sky the early stargazers might have imagined that the double whammy of Sirius and the sun caused a lot of hot weather or dog days which is a term still used Sirius has been known since ancient times and has been signified its nature as scorching or sparkling. sparkling. It, it was associated with the Egyptian god Osiris and other gods. Ancient Egyptians noted that Sirius rose just before the sun each year immediately prior to the annual flooding of the Nile River. Although the floods could bring destruction, they also brought new soil and new life. Fittingly, Fittingly, Osiris, whom Sirius may have represented, was a good god of life, death, fertility, and rebirth of the plant life along the Nile. In India, Sirius is sometimes known as Vanna, the dog prince. The prince and his four brothers, along with Savannah, set out along um, an address journey to find the kingdom of heaven. However, one by one, the brothers all abandoned the search until only Yudhistra and Svanna were left. Okay, now the Nomo description. The Nomos are ancestral spirits, sometimes referred to as deities, worshipped by the Dogon tribe of Mali. The word nomo is derived from a Dogon word meaning to make one drink. The nomos are usually described as amphibious, hermaphobic, hermaphroditic, fish like creatures. Folk art depictions of nomos so creatures with humanoid upper torsos, legs, feet, and a fish like lower torso and tail. The nomos are also referred to as the masters of the water, the monitors, and the teachers. Dogon mythology states that the Nomo was the first living creature created by the sky god Amo. Shortly after his creation, Nomo underwent a transformation and multiplied into four pairs of twins. And the Zulus. This came from an um, anthropologist and archaeologist. I forgot the name of the dude, but. I once spent time with uh, Credo Motoa, the leader of the Zulu tribe in Africa. He told me that the Zulus had a similar experience with the Nomo and that his tribe also had the knowledge they brought for hundreds of years. It is notable that the Zulu gave them the same name, Nomo, as um, Credo Motoa, Motoa told me the Zulu story. I realized that it differed from the Dogons in only two points. The first small difference between the two stories is that where the Dogon say the Nomo made a hole in the ground and filled it with water. The Zulus say that the Nomo landed in the valley and then made it rain until they, the valley was filled with water. 
which is the same thing it's just more detailed in both cases no more they came over to them and communicated that they were from the star series I don't want to get too deep into the mysticism of the Dogons but I want to get into their astrological sciences it is important to remember that although many port many parts of the Dogon legend seems to ring true other portions are clearly mistaken one of the Dogon beliefs is that Sirius B occupied the place where the Sun is now physics clearly prohibits this also if the Dogon believe that the Sirius B orbits Sirius A every 50 years why do they hold their celebrations every 60 years that's what I was talking about I don't know where the 50 year thing came from but it, it came from somewhere Sirius A is the brightest star in our sky and can be easily seen in the winter months in the northern hemisphere. Look for the constellation Orion. Orion's belt are the three bright stars in a row. Follow an imaginary line through the three stars to Sirius, which is just above the horizon. Okay, this is what they was talking about. This is Orion. You'll have the, the um, Orion's belt. And you can follow the far left star to Canis Major. And it is the brightest star in the Canis Major constellation. Okay, this is an excerpt from the first Americans were Africans. It is documented evidence. Do you remember that the Dogon are descendants of the proto mandig people of Africa? On a similar note, the Dogon from Mali, Africa have another connection in America. It seems that the Hopi, one of the uh, Pueblo tribes, and the Dogon have similar clothing, ornaments, ceremony, ceremonial masks, and headdresses. The Hopi also paint their faces not similar but identical to the Dogon in West Africa. See if you can follow this. Given the Hopi and the Pueblo are related, the Hopi, Pueblo, and Dogon have striking other identical similarities besides those stated above. They also have identical cliff dwellings to those in Mali that can be found in Canyon de Chile's National Monument in Arizona. Additionally, the findings of the hereditary study of the Hopi in Navajo confirmed that the genetic similarity of the two populations relatively the Navajo and Apache have related linguistics and ethnic similarities just as the Hopi and Navajo are genetically related. Genetically Navajos are more closely related to the Apache using the um, transitive property, property in equality the large family of the Hopi, Pueblo, Dogon, Navajo and, Ap and Apache are all related. Okay. Both the Hopi and the Dogon believe that they were the first inhabitants of the earth. Some trace the Hopi back to Atlantis. Both the Hopi and the Dogon had great knowledge of the stars, just as the Dogon knew of Sirius B, which can't be seen. The Hopi knew of black holes in space. They called planets that suck. And mainly they believe they both believe they were created from visitors from the sky making them the original hybrids. Both the Dogon and Hopi used oral stories and rituals to pass along traditional beliefs. Okay, here's some Hopi Indian facts. The Hopi Indians and their ancestors are Native Americans who have lived in northwestern Arizona for thousands of years. Information suggests that the name Hopi is translated to mean peaceful person. The Southwest Amer American Indians inhabit an area called the Black Mesa, a plateau which raises 1,000 feet above the surrounding grasslands and refer to this place as the center of the universe. They are entirely surrounded by the much larger Navajo Reservation. Facts and history about these Southwest American Indians can be found below. 
Happy Indian General Facts. Um, this is some stuff that we just talked about. So we're going to keep going. Okay. Every major star of the constellation corresponds to a ruined site or village that the Hopi are currently living in. Currently living in. When we take a look at the left shoulder of Orion, we find a place called Wupataki. It's north of Flagstaff, Arizona. The Hopi built this ruin about 1100 AD. Then we find another place called the Homolobi ruin by Winslow, Arizona. This one corresponds to the right shoulder of Orion and the star Betelgeuse. And the Hopi also settled up north of the Mesas. And here we have found that the sites correspond to the star Regal. So we can find a whole complex of villages that correspond to the right foot of Orion and to the star uh, so off. Coincidence? I think I don't think so. If you look at the Sumerian and the Egyptian stories and the stories of the Maya, if you look at all these cultures, what you will see is the same story told in different ways in different languages. Those who came from the stars came here and they started human civilization. And what is incredible is that all of these stories, legends, and tales have to do directly with the constellation of Orion. And having said that, it cannot be a coincidence. The Hopi migrated all over Southwest, and after a series of building villages and abandoning the, these villages, they came to these three primary messes in northern Arizona. They called them the first, second, and third messes. The Hopi messes shape Orion's belt image and it is said that the Hopi specifically came here because of the shape so we know for sure that the Hopi were extremely interested in Orion's belt and for them it was the center of their universe they say it was a place where they can make contact with the gods and according to some researchers not only do the three messes represent the stars in Orion's belt but when connected to the other Hopi landmarks throughout southwest the collective sites make the entire body of the Orion constellation and that is not speculation that is truth here we have the hoppy villages that I was just mentioning the three messes right here creating Orion's belt and all the other villages creating the body here, are, here is the belt here's the three messes as above so below and here is what I was talking about earlier that if you follow the three the, the three stars of Orion's belt it will lead you straight to Sirius okay as phenomenal phenomenal as the reach of the Dogons across the African continent is it is also worth noting their reach across the Atlantic. In 2002, Charles A. Serema published a book, Benjamin Banneker, Surveyor, Astronomer, Publisher, Patriot. In it, he discusses how a Dogon prince became the grandfather of Benjamin Banneker. Banneka, as he called himself, Banny being his given name and Ka, his family name, was very adept at predicting the weather and prevailing winds such that he could advise when and how to plant crops. Of Benjamin Banneker, Serama writes, in the late 1700s, Benjamin Banneker reportedly said that Sirius was both his favorite star and his lucky star and called it a double star many years before professional scientists of the advanced world confirmed that fact. Here's a little more on Benjamin Banneker. From he lived from 1731 to 1806. Brother Ben Bay. He was a more a free African American astro architect, astronomer, mathematician, surveyor, former, and the author of the first almanac. 
It was a Dogon type of. This is a nation of people from Mali, Africa. They are direct descendants of ancient Kemet. Benjamin fought against slavery. He was big in the anti-slavery movement, even wrote letters to Thomas Jefferson. He talked to the, founder, found the founding fathers about their actions and how they were setting up the government and advised them on it. He taught them the Wabanaki Confederacy, which they stole and copied along with other Moorish and Native American nation constitutions. One of his greatest accomplishments is the design of Washington, D.C. The layout of Washington, D.C. is aligned with the stars and the universe. Very few places on Earth are designed like this. Kemet, which, <clears throat> which the Romans named their city empire after the Holy Roman Empire. I had to ex explain that to help people understand that what I'm about to say about Washington, D.C. So, I want y'all to remember that that the Holy Comedic Empire, um, the Romans named their land after that, and those are still pretty much the descendants of the people that's running the world today. Here's a little bit about the um, Wabanaki Confederacy. <clears throat> the Wabanaki Eastern Confederacy was a coalition of five Indian tribes of the Eastern Seaboard banded together in response to Iroquois aggression. These tribes, the Abenaki, the, Pen the Penobscot, and the, Malis the Maliset, and the Pasamakuari, and the Mi'kmaq, each retained their own political leadership but collaborated on border issues with such as diplomacy, war, and trade. The confederation officially disbanded in 1862, but the five tribes remain close allies and the Wabanaki Confederacy lives on in the form of a political alliance between these historically friendly nations. There is some confusion associated with the term Wabanaki. It literally means people of the Don or Don land people, meaning Easterners. And at times, all five tribes of the Wabanaki Confederate Confederacy have referred to themselves this way. We all know the sun rises in the east. She liked it. Okay, more about Benjamin Banneker. Without Benjamin Banneker, our nation's capital would not exist as we know it. After a year of work, the Frenchman hired by George Washington to design the capital stormed off the job, taking all the plans. Banneker, placed on the planning committee at Thomas Jefferson's request, saved the project by reproducing from memory in two days a complete layout of the streets, parks, and major buildings. Thus, Washington, D.C. itself can be considered a monument to the genius of this great man. We're going to get into the what he what he did it's pretty dope Banneker's English grandmother immigrated to the Baltimore area and married one of her slaves named Banneke later their daughter did likewise and gave birth to Benjamin in 1731 since by law free slave status depended on the mother Banneker like his mother was technically free Banneker attended an elementary school run by Quakers one of the few colorblind communities at that time. Not literally colorblind, but skin colorblind. In fact, he later adopted many Quaker habits and ideas as a young man. He was given a pocket watch by a business associate. This inspired Banneker to create his own clock made entirely of wood in 1753. Famous as the first clock built in the New World America, it kept perfect time for 40 years. During the Revolutionary War, wheat grown on a farm designed by Banneker helped save the fledging U.S. troops from starving. After the war, Banneker took up astronomy. In 1789, he successfully predicted an eclipse. From 1792 to 1802, 
Banneker published an annual farmer's almanac for which he did all the calculations himself. The almanac won Banneker fame as far as away as England and France. He used his reputation to promote social change, namely to eliminate racism and war. He sent a copy of his first al almanac to Thomas Jefferson with a letter protesting that the man who declared that all men are equal owned slaves. Jefferson responded with enthusiastic words but no political reform. Similarly, Banneker's attempts to inspire a veneration of human life and, and horror of war fell mainly on deaf ears. Banneker's reputation was never in doubt. He spent his last years as an internationally known polymath form, <clears throat> farmer, engineer, surveyor, city planner, astronomer, mathematician, inventor, author, and social critic. He died on October 25, 1806. Today, Banneker does not have the reputation he should, although the entire world could still learn from his words. Ah, why will men forget that they are brethren? Banneker's life is, in, is inspirational. Despite the popular prejudices, pre, prejudices of his time, the man was quite willing to let his race and his age hinder him in any way, his thirst for intellectual development. The disbelievers would appear to be more credible until it is realized that in the late 1700s, Benjamin Banneker reportedly said Sirius was both his favorite star and his lucky star. Like I said earlier, some have used this to assert that he mystically inherited this knowledge as if it had been transmitted through his DNA. It's called atavism. But the simpler explanation would appear to be that Grandfather Banneka had talked of certain ancient wisdom to Molly who passed it along to Benjamin when he was a boy. Banneker may later have adapted it to fit his own updated astro astronomical thoughts. <laughs> and this is the way he had predicted it long before long long before any European scientist did this is series B the one we can visually see this is the Sun so we are right in this area here this is how far series B is and series A is <laughs> this is a, a very bad exaggeration but it is much larger than the Sun but it's a lot farther and which is why it, we see it the way we do when we take photos of the sun Washington DC like the cities in ancient Kemet they are built in honor to a deity god or goddess this is why DC is built partially in Virginia in partly in Maryland. This represents the Virgin Mary. Symbolically Virginia in <clears throat> symbolically Virginia Virgin in Maryland Mary, which is a spin-off of Isis. The Virgin Mary would bless this new republic country. So the buildings have to line up with the stars, thus the saying as it is in heaven shall it be in, on earth. This is paying homage to the deity. There are only a few people in the world that can do this astro architecture. Astro means stars. Arch architecture means design and building. As a mathematician and, and inventor, these are strong skills you need for astro architecture. With those skills, he also wrote the first farmers, farmers almanac. Um, which uses lunar moon combined with solar sun to predict weather patterns and seasons. The extraordinary truth is that the very existence of the Washington Monument is intimately linked with the Egyptian star Sirius.
which the ancients represented in their sacred hieroglyphics as an obelisk as well as a star. How is it possible that this most important star of ancient world should find itself as it were resurrected in the architecture of the United States? We know exactly how. So let's keep going. Europeans always play dumb when it comes to this shit. Like, they want to credit everything to Satan and the Illuminati to steer people away from learning the greatness of black history. The Egyptian hierogram for the star Sirius consists of three shapes. A five-pointed star, an oval, and an obelisk. Amazingly, this is just what you find in stone in Washington, D.C. The entire city is dedicated astronomically to the star Sirius and its occult deities. Astrology is good enough <clears throat> is good enough for the ruling plutocrats, it seems. Pity that when the ordinary person seeks to use the div divination of arts for their own personal, physical, and spiritual empowerment, they are considered freaks and devil worshippers. Here is um, the outline of the owl. You can also see the um, the compass is a part of it. And <clears throat> here's a part of the brain which completely mirrors um, the owl. And we look at some of the owl meanings in the realms of uh, animal symbolism. The owl is sacred to Greek goddess of learning Athena Athena <clears throat> and is even depicted on some Greco-Roman currency as a symbol of status intelligence and of course wealth in ancient Egyptian Celtic and Hindu cultures the symbolic meaning of Al revolved around guardianship of the underworld and the protection of the dead in this light the Al was ruler of the night and seer of souls a misunderstanding of this necessary relationship gave the owl some negative associations with death. It should be clear that the owl was honored as a keeper of spirits who had passed from one plane to another. Often myth indicates that the owl accompanying a spirit to the underworld, winging its newly freed soul from the physical world into the realm of the spirits. Being aware of the owl's symbolic meanings is a good way to connect with these fascinating creatures and also become more in tune with the owl's wisdom. Here are nocturnal <clears throat> animal symbolism includes dreams, shadows, otherworldliness, secret knowledge, and psychic awareness. When we connect the owl with its own environment and according to its way of life, it helps in deciphering the messages the owl has for us. Why? Because owls and all creatures of the animal realm are pure energy and they come from a place of wholeness as such they communicate in a unified voice. They speak in the language of the trees, the wind, the moon, the sky, etc. Learning the owl's habitat is a great way to learn her language and more clearly understand her voice when she chortles in our spiritual ears. And here's the old map of Washington DC. You can see the, um, the Star of David and the, um, the Masonic Compass. <clears throat> which is a um, <clears throat> Supreme Council. 33rd degree temple is right here. The, <laughs> the White House is right here. The US Capitol is over here and the Lincoln Memorial is over here. It's all set on a 90 degree angle. Millionaires do not use astrology, billionaires do. Words of J.P. Morgan. In Washington, D.C., we have the phallic monument facing the female Oval Office, plus the Pentagon. In Paris, we find Cleopatra's Needle, another obelisk in front of the Notre Dame Virgin Mary's Cathedral. The Vatican has another masculine obelisk surrounded by a feminine circular building structure. In London, New York, and many other places you will find the same. 
The Brotherhood has placed their sexual architecture at key geomantic points all over the earth. I wouldn't so much call it sexual, but you know, a European wrote this. The obelisk and the dome are common sites in the monuments and buildings of the Brotherhood. The obelisk is an ancient phallic symbol of the male energy and the solar energy. That's why I wouldn't call it sexual. And the dome represents the female or moon energy. Often they are placed together or close to each other. This is the symbolism of the oval office, the womb, female, and the White House, which looks out on, out on the Washington Monument, the vast stone obelisk, the phallic male. These symbols attract and generate the energy they represent. They are a physical thought form. The obelisk also symbolizes the penis of the Egyptian sun god Osiris. According to legend, after Osiris has been sliced to pieces by his rival set, the queen Isis found all the pieces except his willy. An obelisk claim to come from Alexandria in Egypt stands in Central Park, New York and its twin was erected in the 19th century during the reign of Queen Victoria on the former Templar lands alongside the river Thames not far from the House of uh, Parliament. It is known as Cleopatra's Needle and originally stood in on the Egyptian city of the sun from at least 1500 BC before it was moved to Alexandria. Here's a picture of the obelisk inside the Visca Pisces, which is um, a male and female in um, a, a, the procreation. And we can see that here that it is a um, polarity or separation sharing, heaven separating spiritual with physical and the all-seeing eye. This is also where the fish comes from when you see it um, in a lot of religious texts, um, mostly Catholics and Christians. <clears throat> Here we have the, um, the long walkway and the astrological alignments. Get deeper into that. So, 4th of July alignment, Washington, D.C. I mean, there's nothing a lot to say about this, but it all centers around the sun. It is the only day in the year where the sun and Orion's belt rise precisely together. And that's the meaning of the 4th of July. Then we have the winter solist <clears throat> where the sun's lined up with the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial. And there's no reflection of the sun on the pool like on the 4th of July. So you have to remember all of this is accredited. It should be accredited to Benjamin Banneker, but it's not. They also kept the secrets of ancient lead lines and continue building along them for instance the cities of Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore and Washington DC are all on a perfect diagonal that continues down into the um, to the ancient Teotihuacan and all the way up to Stonehenge, Troy, Baalbek, London to Giza and Paris to Dendera are almost parallel lines. This geomantic knowledge was understood and kept hidden by ancient builders, masons. It remains that way today until now. On evenings from August 10th to the 15th as the sun sets over Pennsylvania Avenue, the constellation Virgo appears in the sky above the White House in the Federal Triangle. At that same moment, the setting sun appears precisely above the apex of a stone pyramid in the old post office tower. 
which is just wide enough to occlude the solar disk according to the 19th century Freemason Ross Parsons the assumption of the Virgin Mary is fixed on the 15th of August because at that time the Sun is so entirely in the constellation of Virgo that the stars of which it is composed are rendered rendered invisible in the bright uh, rays of the sunlight so in closing I want to point this out many red Native Americans which they say um, those um, a group of Chinese people that came over and bred with the already here Omlimex and Native American tribes that led to some of the tribes becoming red color. Many red Native Americans that I have spoken with are well aware of the information that I have just presented to you. Some are not aware. Tribes like Hopi, Aztec, Apache, Pueblo, Seminole, Creek, basically the Udo Aztec whole area have documents in their possessions that tells the stories of the black gods who gave birth to them. In fact, the Hopi book of the stars that was given to them by the Dogons tells that when the forefathers, Africans, reclaimed their throne, that the black and red tribes would join together and destroy the white man. There is a similar parable in most Native American cultures that speaks of the white eagle who captured the red eagle until the black eagle freed the red eagle. The white eagle retreated in the caves from which it came. Look this story up. It is an actual story in Native American culture. It is just as important for red Native Americans to understand the true history as it is for blacks in America. Blacks have been convinced that they are all former African slaves. Of course this is a lie. There have been blacks in this country for thousands of years before the first Europeans. There are millions of blacks in America if they trace their family heritage will not find any African slavery in their family which is how I learned that I was connected to the Hoppies to my father's side. Many blacks are children of the Yamasee, Yom Seminole, Creek, Cherokee, Blackfoot, Shoshone, etc. However, the U.S. government in order to protect their best interests has kept most of this from true history. So it's important that we learn our ancestry. It's, it, it is important. We are all not Cherokee. We need to learn that. The U.S. has also convinced us to classify ourselves as a title that the European political system created in order to place us in certain social bracket. The African American. As, it, as an African American, we have no inalienable or indigenous rights under the Constitution. Even worse, as an African American Christian, we dig an even deeper hole for ourselves. As black Christians, we have admitted to two things. We are former slaves by calling ourselves African, and we are former slaves who converted to the slave owner's religion. Thus, we sever any connection to sovereignty or self-identity. As an African American Christian, we literally become dependent on the government and relinquish all indigenous and self-governing classifications. Thus, we throw away ourselves on the mercy of the U.S. judicial system. Native Americans have what is called autonomy or self-government, similar to diplomatic immunity. As indigenous people, we have the right to set up our own sovereign nations, where we govern our own judicial system, legislative, and penal system. As an African American, we have the right of self-government and indigenous rights by admitting that we are immigrants coming from somewhere else, somewhere else, and not indigenous. So as an African American, we have the right of self-government and indigenous rights by admitting that we are immigrants came over from someone else and not indigenous. The classification of African American is not a legal term. It is not a legal term and the government knows this. This is why we cannot file for reparations because we have not declared ourselves a nation and we have we own no land in America to become a sovereign nation.
so in closing I want to go through this quick little film of Benjamin Banneken the Dogon Benjamin Banneken in the United States you ever wonder why Egyptian culture dominates the symbolism of the USA Benjamin Banneker, November 9th, 1731 through October 9th, 1806, the man who designed the Washington, D.C. and the United States Direct Declaration of Independence. Born in Africa, one biographer has suggested that Banneker was a member of the Dogon tribe. He was a descendant. The Dogon of Mali, who are descendants of, the, of Kemet, have had from antiquity a vast knowledge of Series A, B, and C. Ancient knowledge of the multi-generational knowledge passed down by Dogon elders. Banneker corresponded with Thomas Jefferson on the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson sent a letter to the Marquis de Condor said, I am happy to be able to inform you that we have now in the United States a Negro, the son of a black man born in Africa, who is a very respectable mathematician. I have seen very elegant solutions of geometrical problems by him. Add to this that he is a very respectable member of society. He is a free man. President Washington hired him for the laying out of the new federal city. It was Banneker who made the astronomical calculations and implements that established points of significance in the capital city, including those of the 16th Street Meridian. The White House, the Capitol, and the Treasury Building and he helped in selecting the sites for those features. When his co-worker took the plans with him after leaving with no dismissal and leaving no copies behind, Benjamin spent two days reconstructing the bulk of the city's plans from memory. The Dogon system reveals precise knowledge of cosmo cosmological Facts only known by the development of modern astronomy series known in ancient Egypt, Egyptians based their calendar on the helical rising of Sirius, namely the day it becomes visible just before sunrise after moving far enough away from the glare of the sun. More foul play. On this day of his funeral in 1806, a fire burned Banneker's log cabin to the ground, destroying many of his belongings and papers. The Dogon Benjamin Banneker in the United States and this was my first black history lecture hope everybody enjoyed it I was thinking small times, trying to make the come up, the blow used to numb up a few G's a week.